general questions, which, which are kind of around the divide stuff. Anything that was subject specific, um, Michael's going to be covering all the accounting questions, Joel's going to be covering the business questions, and then we've got Mairead who will be covering the economics as well. And then, as I said, I'll give a little bit of time at the end for the live group. So I'm not going to waste too much time with it. We, we let the panelists kind of pick and choose or, or I'll direct a few questions to them. Um, but we, we get stuck into it straight away. And I suppose in teacher plan, I've tried to color code these for each topic. And um, so the first one that I got in was how does your scheme of work look like or, or, or how do you plan your scheme of work? And I suppose this was really geared towards how do you differentiate it between fifth and sixth year? Uh, and I suppose I'll start with Michael Galligan for accounting, if he doesn't mind. Michael, could you, could you give us some information, please? Um. To be honest with you, for Leaving Cert Business, I just tend to work through from beginning to end. Uh, what I would normally be trying to do is reach maybe early into Unit 5 by the end of fifth year. Now, <clears throat> I know that people change it around. Some people, a lot of people will start with the units that are going to be the ABQ, so that it gives them a chance to come back to it. In truth, I don't really think it makes a huge amount of difference. I've, I've changed it around a few times, uh, and it has worked either way. The nice thing about Leave and Start Business to me is that it's not the biggest course in the world. Um, generally speaking, I wouldn't have a problem finishing it uh, compared to some other subjects. So usually I would be units one, two, and three up to, after Christmas, I'd be somewhere in unit three. The second half of the year, I'd be trying to get unit four and well into unit five done um, so that I can finish off five and just have six and seven to do in, in uh, the first half of sixth year, uh, which would give me a, a time to do a, revi a, a sort of a revision before the mock and a, a nice, I like, I really believe in a big long revision period if I can get it. I mean, I think you need about 10 or 12 weeks to do a really good revision for Leaving Cert Business. Otherwise you're packing huge quantities of information into, into each week and it becomes, I think, too difficult. So you, you actually answered Joe's question there because I was asking you the scheme of work in relation to accounting. Sorry, I thought you said business. <laughs> um, sorry, I picked you up wrong. I, I have a scheme of work. I have a plan. Um, the thing that with accounting that is, I have never met any two teachers who do the same thing. And any time I've ever gone to a conference, people have started with a completely different focus. Um, I tend to start with double entry stuff uh, and I would modularize it insofar as there are certain topics I want to cover in fifth year and there are certain topics I want to cover in sixth year. Now, my big passion would be question one and question five. So I would certainly want to have one, five, part of uh, question eight or nine and, and another topic done in fifth year. Um, so that when I do the, the scattered topics in sixth year, the other 90 markers and the other 60 markers, I'm in a position to keep coming back to question one and keep coming back. I want to get to a stage where one and five and maybe eight or nine, in my case, usually nine, are never far away. So I can keep dropping little bits in so that when the time comes, they can hold on to a fairly solid one, five and nine, and then the other question. Yeah, okay, thank you. So then Joe, in relation to what Michael had said, suppose in, in, in the business question, he was really saying he's got about two units left to cover at the start of six year. Would you be something similar when you're teaching there? Yeah, almost, almost identical. I would aim to get at least four and a half units at least done. Like my ideal would be to get somewhere like three out of the four chapters of unit five up to there done. Um, the other thing that I probably do a little bit differently as well is I take one chapter. So I do the ethics because the stakeholder stuff is in there and impact. So I actually do that as part, like similar to part really of, of unit one I link that in and um, because you're looking at stakeholders you know from, from, from the outset and then I kind of link that piece in impact on, on stakeholders so I've kind of covered that chapter a bit, little bit out of sequence but everything else I've done pretty much in sequence and in a good year I get to somewhere like marketing and um, you know which is probably the third in and around that in a bad year you fall a little bit short but again like, like everything else you're talking PMEs here we're kind of looking at that focus you know you, you have a plan but again you know, you have to be realistic that sometimes a plan has to adapt to the students in front of you. There's no good you just race into a plan and leaving them behind you either. You know, you, you kind of have to you read the room a little bit. So it, sometimes you will be a little, the pace will be a little bit quicker. Sometimes it'll be a little bit off. The other thing that I probably do as well is I try to build in, so I have a similar target in terms of finishing. Like Michael, I would aim to get 
um, you know, my first coverage, you would call it that, uh, pre-mock, and then that leaves you a good bit of time to really focus in from there on. Um, it also means that the students, I suppose, are set up, at least they've everything covered once for, for the mock, you know. Um, so I suppose that that's probably you know, m most of it. I can answer a few other little bits of, of the other questions. Yeah, but yeah. Very similar to what Michael said. Very good. And Moraine, I suppose the economics then might be slightly different because that's quite a short course. Um, would you ever find you're able to cover up <laughs> one year or how do you do the economics? Well, um, I suppose economics teachers, uh, particularly this year, might disagree with you there, Brefney. Um, I suppose I've been um, lecturing methodologies in economics for a long number of years now in UL and hi to all my students that might be uh, watching out there. And one of the things that I always say to them is that the planning is the most important part, okay? And uh, even now, this is where I think the, the game is won and lost, um, you know, in, in teaching. And what I to to PMEs or teachers that are, 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 are starting off, this is the time to put the, 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 the effort into the planning stage. And the question there is, what does your scheme of, of work look like? My scheme of work is um, a, a Google Sheet. OK, and I start off with a very moderate, a very, very um, sort of basic Google sheet in terms of, you know, the content, the course content and what's involved. But then um, what happens is I will then modify it. Now, I suppose once you've done it properly once, you, you, it's a matter of tweaking from then on. But in the context of the new specification in economics, because there's so much new, there's so much that... Um, of the old course still with us. There is elements of the old course that we thought were not going to be included because they weren't identified on the specification, but they're actually still with us. So there's, um, you need something like a Google Sheet. I find that fantastic to work with because you can increase your rows, you can, you can, um, uh, you know, you know, increase it or decrease it over time um, according to your particular needs. In terms of planning, where you can uh, you can uh, you're you're facilitated in interpreting the specification according to to your own vision, um, and also um, it it gives you a, a sort of um, the cut and paste element. So if something doesn't work one year, um, you're not starting from scratch with paper and pen again. You literally you can take what you have and say, yeah, that works. Let's cut it out. You know what I what I what could actually work in 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 its place is this. So um, and also what I think is very very important is. Um, first of all, the time you're actually spending doing the planning, uh, you know, that you, you have, make, you're making sure that all the elements, um, all the learning outcomes of the specification are seen to in the context of your planning. Now, it, it certainly will for the first, you know, couple of years, it takes time. And I myself, you know, with the new specification, uh, really, I've been spending such a huge amount of time in terms of the planning side, because again, I believe that that's where you get the most, um, you get the most back from, from it. Um, because you, once you understand, uh, you know, and are able to interpret it, interpret um, the specification, then your, your sort of, your methodologies um, can support um, what's there. If you're literally just falling along somebody else's track, um, you're going to find, you're, you're going to trip up along the way. Um, one of the other things that may not be included in everybody else's scheme of work, um, I would actually plan, when I'm planning my scheme of work, I would plan trips, I would plan visits, I would plan speakers, and I will give broad areas of, of times in which they would actually uh, be included. So I will actually, as I'm actually taking, uh, you know, uh, uh, I suppose areas of the specification and going through the units, I'll actually um, identify areas of the times of the year when it might suit teaching that unit in order to be able to bring in um, a speaker or bring the students out to, to, to visit. So uh, it's, it can be a, a pretty big document, but I'm um, just to say to new teachers and teachers starting off, that you, for every hour you spend planning is an hour you'll save down the line. And um, it's well worth investing the time there, especially um, with the new um, economic specification. Yeah, yeah, there's been, there's been challenges on that. I know I've been speaking with you about it on, the, on our group as well. But I, like, I mean, I guess I, I would run similar. I teach business to you guys. Um, and I suppose if you're fortunate enough, any PMEs or NQTs, when you go into a school that you may have a system where you're covering fifth year and the other teacher is going to take them over in sixth year. And, and often you can, you can sit down with that teacher and have your kind of start and end point and work within that as well. So, um, right, look, I'll, I'll move on um, to the next question there. 
do you cover your units in order of the book? So, so Mike, I'll go back to you and again in relation to accounting. Would you, I suppose you kind of alluded to in, in your scheme of work that you wouldn't necessarily do this, is that right? No, I don't do them in the order of the book at all. <clears throat> um, I would, no, my situation is coming because in our school, uh, accounting in TY is compulsory for a nine week module and TY is compulsory for a nine week module. So at least everybody is starting from the same place. Yeah. And also then um, my, my TY module is built around the idea of double entry bookkeeping. So I can start with uh, question one, fairly early on and I can have them working on that kind of double entry work straight away. Yeah. I'd also make an issue of starting question five before Christmas of fifth year um, because I think the secret of that question is to spend a really long time doing it. Mm -hmm. Now if that's once those two are going well that gives me 55 percent of the exam straight away yeah. uh, and everything else is, is filling after that. So I'd start those and then um, uh, I'd, after that, I'd usually move into cash budgeting because it's less of an accounting exercise, more of a calculator exercise. Yeah. Uh, it's also, it involves them having to think about the process of what they're doing in a way less than the method of what they're doing because they, they, they find it easy except they can get completely lost of where they are in the questions all the time. So, right. uh, and after that then it's, it really is almost random in terms of, you just kind of see where the strengths of a class are and we move yeah. into what's, what's working after that. Yeah, what about you, Joe? Do you, do you cover the books in, in straight on or unit one? Um, yeah, pretty much. I definitely would start with unit one. As I said already, I kind of think for me, starting with, with you know, with people in business, there's a lot of kind of foundational stuff there. And I think, you know, you're, you're introducing some key concepts there that really are foundation for what follows. So for me, it's a really obvious place to start. Um, you, you know, certainly the early chapter or so, you could argue, you know, maybe some of the other chapters, but I tend to go with, with that, as I said. The only thing I'd probably do a little bit out of sequence, as I mentioned as well, is that I, I drag the ethics piece in there because I've already introduced the idea of stakeholders and then the impact of the organization on different stakeholders. You wouldn't so need that for maybe an AB2 year that could be units, or you just leave it true? No, no I, I don't, to be honest with you. Um, again, I, look, I just feel, for, for the reason I've said, I, I just feel making a start at the start, it makes sense for me. And, and like the other thing as well to be mindful of is that you sometimes, I wouldn't have a huge number, but I would have maybe one or two students who may not have a, a, a junior cycle background in the subjects as well. So like if you're suddenly launching into the middle of management, you know, without having introduced some of the kind of rudimentary concepts, that could be a bigger challenge. For me, I just, it makes sense to, to, to start at the start. Yeah, um, and there's no specific, even just thinking about it in the context of the assessment. So unlike, unlike at Junior Spike, where it's, the, the assessment is going to be a lot more blended uh, and therefore there's, a, there's probably a bigger value and, 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 and need to, to blend the learning. There's not the same emphasis at, at Senior Cycle because the paper is, 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 is much more, let's say, linear and, and this, the units are a little bit more discrete. So, you know, you, it, it kind of makes sense to follow that to me anyway. Yeah, I remember, I remember speaking with a teacher and they said that at fifth year, they're still trying to get their students to love the subject. And I think if you maybe are covering it in that way, you're, you are giving them that chance. Like you've got the, maybe the fun stuff you can do with consumer law and then you've got the enterprise and you've got a lot of nice stuff early on that doesn't make Yeah, and if they, if, they have done junior, if they have done junior cycle as well, there, there's, some, there's some nice material there in relation to say consumer that actually is familiar for them as well quite early on. And I think that maybe reassures some of them, yeah. you know, who might be kind of thinking, oh, maybe is isn't, isn't for me. It's nice maybe when they see something that's a little bit familiar, you know, that they, they already have a good grounding in it. Yeah. Um, I think that's reassuring. Super stuff. Murray, what about you then for economics? Is it, is it a bit more straightforward or? Oh, sorry, Mareida. You're muted, Mareida. Is Mareida on mute there? You're muted. Sorry, Murray, I don't know how we got you muted. There you go. Are we okay? Yeah. Um, what I was saying there, Brittany, is actually, you know, as it turns out, I mean, 
because I suppose, um, I, I, you might disagree here, but I, I, I feel economics is probably the most exciting business subject to teach, you know, yeah. and that's what, I, that's what I always tell the, the PMEs. And the truth is, it is because it's constantly changing. There's this dynamic constantly going on out there that really means that we can't separate ourselves from the world outside, nor would we want to. And in that way, um, I suppose with the old course, it was a little bit more um, sort of capsuled. But with this new course and the way it's actually designed, um, and it's taken, I suppose, the two years really for us all to sort of grapple with and get used to it, is that we uh, we can see, I suppose, um, the, the concept of unit one being that like unifying um, strand, and basically which um, reaches out to the other strands. And in this way, um, I suppose the way I would be approaching it: Do I do? Would I teach it um, the, the the units in the order of the book? Um, the answer is is actually no. But um, I use a, a sort of a, a model that I've come up with myself, and it's called the fit model. Does it fit? Okay. F is is it fundamental? The second thing is I for is it important? And the third thing is it topical? And I, I say to PMA students that basically. First of all, when you're teaching economics, you're teaching fundamentals, you're teaching building blocks, you're teaching the concepts. It's only when they have the grasps of these concepts that they can actually move forward. Um, I ask them to look at it in the context of almost like an extra language. You wouldn't have students walk into a French class and then the, the, um, the teacher um, throw an article from Le Monde at them and say, off you go there now, uh, read that away. So nor would you in, in economics. So what you do is you break it down and you break down the, the modules. And that's why that unifying um, strand at the beginning is very, very good because it introduces them in a, in a sort of a piecemeal way to the building blocks that they'll need. Now, um, I was, uh, I suppose, a, a bit of a maverick um, with the, when, uh, last year with the Leading Cert group that I had. And I decided, I was looking at the, the, um, the research project, which was brand new, and I was figuring that there was going to be a lot um, in the latter sections in unit three, four or five that would be applicable. So I took a dive um, and I, I jumped into unit four and started with um, national income rather than starting what I usually would do with my um, the micro section. And um, it, it actually worked out fantastic, I suppose, because it meant in a way that I was able to, when lockdown happened, I was able to, um, you know, it was much, much um, easier to teach the, the non-micro side, economics teachers know what I mean, uh, from, from home. So then when we came back um, to yeah. school in September, we were able to hit the floor running, um, you know, with um, teaching the, 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 you know, the price mechanism, consumer, you know, the markets, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, which you really need to be with them and engage with them in order to get that kind of dynamic yeah. going. So the order of the units, uh, you know, I asked them myself, do they fit? And if they fit, then that's fine. But certain things I would take into consideration, like, let's say, for example, when the, um, the budget, I would always coincide um, teaching um, you know, the, 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 um, the budget um, area um, when the budget is actually produced because you're able to bring live, real issues into the classroom to the students rather than teaching the budget, um, you know, in March or, you know, later and you're asking them to remember back what happened in the budget. Um, I'd often bring in popcorn into the classroom and we would sit and we would watch the budget uh, live in the classroom. You know, these are the kind of things that make them realise, oh my God, this is something that, that is actually um, real. Um, other things that I would say is, you know, we're a very topical subject. Um, you know, I know in business it's topical as well, but in economics, um, it seems to me that the way the, uh, the course is at the moment, and especially with the research study, that more and more we need to engage with topical issues. And if that means dropping um, a topic and moving to one that's topical, then that's what we need to do. We need to be flexible in, in our subject mm -hmm. and in order to engage students uh, you know, to the fullest and uh, for them to achieve their potential. Brilliant, brilliant, thank you. Okay, so um, I'll start. I'll start trying to maybe go through this a little bit quicker because I'm often quite quite conscious of the time, guys. I don't want to just here all night as much as I'd probably like to be. Uh, so, question three, then I suppose, how long should each chapter take? This is a question that came in from Katrina. Uh, I could kind of know the answer here, um, which is, well, I'll let Joe answer it. Joe, what do you think? How long? How long should each chapter take? <laughs> Business wise, sorry, Joe. I think you're on mute again. Yeah, um, sorry. I I usually plan most chapters or topics over seven to eight forty minute lessons. So you know, right. most of them are in similar. Some of the shorter ones. So um, unit two, which is quite short, actually, you could probably cover that in five six classes. 
obviously there's and one or two of the longer ones. So I think the, the chapter section on communications is actually quite long because you've got the theory and you've also got the kind of applied bits where you're having to actually, you know, do out minutes and, and all of that kind of stuff and form a lettering and, you know, all that stuff. So that probably can take a little bit longer. So that might be kind of 10 to 12. Um, but I would always build in a little bit. I was kind of saying earlier that even though I have, I have like I would have it two or three weeks at the end of every couple of months. So like our, our kind of big breaks into our natural breaks in terms of term or half term, I would have a week or maybe even two weeks towards heading towards our February exams or whatever, where I would kind of have a, a, a no a, a break basically where I could use that as catch up time for time lost. Okay. And so it kind of gives you a little bit of roll up. So that's what I kind of would, would work off. Because again, sometimes with a class, a topic will take a little bit longer than you plan for, but it's worth spending the time to get it right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Michael, what about you then for, for, for each chapter? Would it, would it vary? Imagine it does. Beyond belief. Um, beyond belief. Uh, like some topics, effectively, I would have them running the entire two years. Um, I, I, rather than, I, I often don't finish a topic. I will take a topic a bit further. I'll go away and do something else. I'll, I'll return to that topic, consolidate, take it a little bit further, go away again and come back again. Um, and to be honest with you, particularly accounting, uh, because it's a skill as opposed to, in many ways, a learn, you, you walk into one group and they just pick it up easy peasy and you think you're the best teacher in the whole wide world ever and you think you've discovered a brilliant way to teach it and then you walk into the class next year and you are taken back down a peg because no matter what you try and do they're not getting it and you're having to go back over the same thing and over the same thing and over the same thing again so it's not my strength that's all I'll admit to <laughs> to being able to stick to the timetable that I probably should um but I find sometimes I'm way ahead of myself and other times I'm miles behind myself. Yeah, so it depends. All right, what about for you then? Would you, would you um, have a set time for chapters? Yeah, well, what I, I would usually say to students is that the chapter length is merely the um, the, the author's interpretation of, of, of the specification. So, for example, one chapter might take you a week. And, for example, the markets chapter, I would give a week to each uh, market. So I'd be spending, you know, the week at perfect competition, the week at imperfect, the week at... So that one would... That's one chapter that would take four weeks, you know. So again, I, I agree with um, um, everybody here, you know, that it, it's it's um, it's what you know works. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, so again, uh, maybe one or two more planning before we move then into the teaching part of it. Uh, in a class of mixed abilities, how do you tackle higher and ordinary levels at the same time, especially if there's more ordinary than higher level students. Uh, Mairead, I might come back to you just simply because my knowledge of the economics course isn't as good. Uh, the, the actual paper, would it vary greatly between higher and ordinary level? Uh, and are, are they then therefore totally different classes or a bit like business, is it similar topics, just maybe easier questions? Yeah, that would be that would be pretty much what you you would have. You know, it's the same. It's 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 the the same elements of the specification, but the the the, the assessment really is what differentiates there. Um, so that would be what you're you're dealing with. Um, would you would you then take your higher and ordinary level class? And I mean, I've done it in the past. Later on in the year, when it really comes to crunch time, where I'd say, right, anybody who's planning on sitting higher level. I need you on this side of the room. Anybody in ordinary level, I need you on that side of the room. And I generally do that because I'm at a stage now where we're, we're very emphasizing the leaving cert questions. Or maybe earlier on in the year, I might get a few ordinaries mixed in with the higher levels. But like, would you would you be able to, would you do a strategy like that? Or again, what, well, what's your approach? to be quite honest with you, um, every, I take every, every student that I teach, um, uh, will come in as they are, okay? But my my objective is to have uh, every student uh, a higher level student. And um, mm -hmm. how do I do that, okay? Um, so every, if you imagine, every single class that I, I ever teach is a mixed ability class. So um, I suppose for a, a lot of different reasons, the reasons we become teachers, the reason PMT ETEs are PMEs and they're not, they're not, you know, working in, in uh, businesses is because they, they, they want to help students, they want them to de develop, they want them to reach their potential. 
So I suppose very early on in my teaching, and I, again, I suppose I find you know teaching methodologies in UL, you know, um, it really keeps me in grip of this. That it's my task to really try and elevate as many uh, ordinary level students as I possibly can, and make sure that they're they can do at the peak of their potential. Now I know it isn't possible all the time. I don't split a class ever. I, what I would do is I would um, I would use strategies that will um, that will benefit the entire class. Okay, so I'll give you maybe just a couple of examples. Um, what I would often use is I will I will use little always little tricks um, you know in order to help students remember certain concepts. Um, they may sound like silly little tricks, and you know the students will think, oh God, here she comes again. She's another one. But the the reality is that they don't only um, assist a student. Um, who's at ordinary level, but they assist every single student in the class. So you'll find even, you know, your highest achiever will be, you know, whatever little trick you gave him, he'll be rattling it off, uh, you know, tell them. I, you know, for example, when we're doing, um, doing a perfect competition from teaching equilibrium and um, maybe the higher level students may understand it's when marginal costs equal to marginal revenue and they'll understand why but maybe another student might have no idea about what's going on but if I say equilibrium um, 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 they will know oh it's the M words that go together so the mar marginal cost marginal revenue both begin with M and they're equal so I will have an ordinary level student and a higher level student both having perfectly um, you know, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, achieving the, the, what, what's needed in order to get um, marks in that particular question. Other things that I found with economics um, is, um, and this is one that I, I shared in the, uh, the recent PDST um, I think, uh, uh, meeting, and it's one where I would have something called a word wall. It'd be an economics word wall that I would um, put on the, uh, the wall. And, you know, this way I would actually um, introduce the concepts and I would in ensure the students actually use the concepts. And so even when we're actually having um, some kind of a debate or some kind of, um, uh, you know, discussion in economics, I will try and ensure that they will use the, the, the terminology that's there. So it's constantly, uh, you know, feeding into um, how they interpret and um, the specification. And then it, when it comes to actually writing stuff down, all of these terms are embedded um, in, in what they actually do. The other thing I suppose is I use lots of um, activities, active learning. Um, a lot of people who've been to, um, you know, the BSTI meetings and have been to um, Economics Alive would have seen um, me, uh, you know, doing my um, diminishing margin utility um, activity uh, using Oreos or, or Smarties or whatever. Um, basically, I do whatever it needs to do in order to keep, try and keep everybody going, because even though it, it's a fun activity, it, it benefits both um, the, the ordinary level and the, the higher level in, the, in, in, in equal measure, because both will learn it and embed it for, forever, really. Thank you. Uh, Joe, Michael, do you have anything to add on that? Do you have, do you have in terms yeah, of your yeah. I, I was actually really interested in the point where I made, I've written out a couple of little bits here myself and, and the point about the students sitting in front of you, you know, mixed ability. So we tend to all teach mixed ability classes and in, the, in terms of the subjects that I'm teaching, so leaving cert business and, and even junior cycle, the, the language around levels is really only at a, a, an assessment term. So the students in front of us mm. are a mixed ability grouping. When we talk about higher and ordinary level, or even common level, that's an assessment term. So, so the, 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 the subject content, the, you know, the content of the learning outcomes on either the syllabus or the specification is going to be the same for all of those students. And Mairead made a great point that, you know, that they, 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 that's a mixed ability cohort of students. And our job is to deliver that content to all of them. And um, obviously at junior cycle, the assessment is going to be common level and that's going to challenge that range of abilities in different ways. The difference is, at, at leaving our business, there's going to be a different paper for each one, so the questioning is going to differentiate them. Um, but you know, and I, the other thing, a couple of things I've written down here would be key terms, active, key vocabulary, and note making for, for particularly for ordinary level students because they may not necessarily be students who are hugely enthusiastic all the time about the subject, and sometimes, um, again, if you if you've ever corrected and even classwork, let alone a state examination work, you'll often find that ordinary level students, one of the big things I see with them is that they don't tend to write an awful lot. You know, yeah. the challenge sometimes is trying to give their marks because there's usually very little on a paper. And I really think you have to get those students actively writing as much as possible. You know, if it's just making their own kind of keynotes, 
uh, as, as they go, because I think it just gives them the vocabulary and it, it keeps them engaged as, as much as possible in the lesson. Um, you know, and as Ray said, look, that, that benefits everybody because ultimately the content certainly at Leaving Cert Business. Yeah, Michael, do you anything different or are you much the same? No, I'd be. I really like Joe's point there that the students are all the same group. Anyway, um, I would, I would make a student work very, very hard to drop down to ordinary level. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't. I very seldom would let. I don't want to sound let. That's overly harsh. It would be rare that myself and a student would agree that they will drop down to ordinary level until they've at least done the mock. Um, as far as I'm concerned, they would be in fifth year and everything they do all the way up to the mock to try and validate the fact that they should be in a position to keep going for the higher level. Uh, and it's only if the mock acts as a kind of a final thing that it, they would tend to drop down. Accounting in our school would, would still be seen as one of the so-called harder subjects. Um, and the one thing I never feel comfortable about is a student dropping uh, in accounting to ordinary level if they're the only student in the room doing it. Um, that's a, a horribly lonely place. Um, and if you're going to inflict a version of suffering on them, I, I think generally they're probably better to suffer the difficulty of higher level with other people than to suffer the loneliness of ordinary level alone. That's a lovely point. And mm -hmm. I suppose it's something that it's very easy to forget when you have students uh, kind of in that position because there's a stereotype that can become attached to that as well, which will go beyond the classroom. So, yeah, it's, it's very nicely put there, Michael. Okay, um, next question that we have here. Okay, great. So that was the kind of end of the planning uh, questions there. So, again, I'm conscious of the time. We're, we're kind of 40 minutes in. So um, I may not go through each subject for each of these because I remember some of them are quite specific. But... Um, maybe in a couple of words, in relation to when you actually teach a class, what are the main resources that you use? So, dare I say it, I'm still very much in the PowerPoint and whiteboard type mode. I don't even have, but we've been in the whiteboard in our face, but I don't, I don't probably use it as much. I, I get straight into writing. Uh, Joe, what about you? Uh, how do you teach a class in terms of your resources? Yeah, again, I try to just mix it. I, I think you just need to try and vary a little bit. So I would use all of those. I don't probably use PowerPoint that much, actually, even though I've created over the years quite a lot of PowerPoints, mostly for other people. But I, I don't actually lean on them that heavily myself. But they're useful sometimes just for key points. Yeah. Um, again, the book, I wouldn't read through the book page by page. It's, you know, I might have the students follow it just with key headings, and then I might add a bit of narrative. Um, news articles, Mairead mentioned already, in business as well, that's, it's quite important and it's, it's quite topical. So it's another subject where you can bring in some good stuff. And, and obviously having, a, a, say, an interactive whiteboard in the room now is fantastic because you have access to, to, to great news articles, you know, so you can use that as your introductory piece, you know, something that was in the news last, last day or whatever else, and you can use that and make that really, really topical, you know. And again, just with, with the technology that we have, we, you know, we can find something relevant for nearly everything. And it's really good for kind of having a hook to engage students, you know, and, and connect the theory. And obviously, invaluable from an exam perspective as well at the end of it all, because, you know, we know that uh, A, they're often required to, to give <laughs> examples or examples count as a, a point in terms of knowledge, you know, so, yeah. so it, it kind of ties it all together. So I think you, you really just have to kind of mix it up a little bit. Just don't get into a, a rut of always just doing, doing the same thing. Again, like, how are you going to get, keep students engaged if that's all you're ever going to do, you know? Yeah. Um, Marie, Michael, anything different there? Marie, I'm maybe going to do anything different that you would do resource-wise as a mix? Uh, resource, it, it'd be a mix, I suppose, uh, but um, I, I uh, like a lot of um, experienced economics students, I use my notes. Um, my notes would be something that I would have, uh, you know, collected over many years and um, collated. And in the context of the new specification, I would have been worked very closely as an associate with um, Sharon Keane and Shane in the PDST to just be able to know exactly how these should be interpreted in order to make sure my notes are specifically what's um, required. And I'm really, really happy with them. The students also, I'm, I, I know that they hit the exact language and um, that they, that this students need there's yeah. enough exam, um, the confidence that comes when you have your own notes as well that you've put up there that you've done that 
goes beyond just the teaching of it that you know you have that ownership of it and yeah. I, I've had PME students that, that would come we, we do a lot of teacher training in our place and they'd say can I have a look at your notes and I'd come and observe them and it's my notes that are on the board and they're like an example comes up and they don't know how to explain yeah. it and yes. I'm trying to say to them look yeah. you have to take ownership of it Yes, and that, of course, that, that of course is the issue. Like, um, I, you know, if you're if you're taking somebody else's idea, you how you interpret it then is is completely different. So, in in terms of notes, um, they're they're yours, and you know, I, especially I would have lots of little tricks written in as part of the the thing that the boys will understand because they're in the class. So, if my notes are disseminated, they 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 may not make um, make a lot of sense. The other thing I suppose I suppose it was interpreting this question: what the main resources used to teach the subject. Pre-COVID and without a, a virus, I um, made huge efforts to actually take the students outside because, again, um, economics and I suppose business in, in particular, you know, our students that are, are subjects that really, really suit bringing your students. So over the years, I would have brought the students. I was taking a look there this morning at brought them to. Um, uh, you know, Claire Byrne Live, uh, to Intel, to Dell, um, you know, you, there's no, um, there's no point in you talking about like um, unit cost of production when you, you, you know, you, you, they don't really know what you're talking about. So if you bring them to Intel and you see production type thing, you can bring them there. And also, I suppose, um, other things I would use are resources created by others. And this um, new, um, I suppose, webinar that is being rolled out by UL and Stephen Kinsler and the team there um, after Easter for economics teachers is going to be really, really exciting. And we're all really looking forward to it because in the context of a new specification, uh, we really need um, you know, economists who are in the real world who will be able to interpret these type of concepts mm. for us and for our students. So we're, we're very grateful to them for that. Um, Michael, what about you then? Is there anything? Um, for, accountancy, for accountancy, I haven't used a book since about 1998. Um, I had a hideous experience doing a question with a class on an adjustment, and it just went so bad, and the, it just turned into a, a nasty experience. And then following it up afterwards, I was kind of going, why was I so stupid? You know, uh, and then it turned out that that one adjustment was in that one question, in that one book, and it never appeared anywhere else ever before or ever again. Um, so I have, uh, I, I, I've, like, I've got 20 something years worth of past Leave and Cert questions, higher and level, ordinary. Now that's 18 questions a year for 20 years. I've got the same worth of mock, uh, like anybody, you know, who every teacher should register with DB and register with ExamCraft and download their past papers and solutions. And you take notes of the things that are a wee bit awkward or a wee bit weird, but there's so much stuff there. And and this year, in a way, ironically, has been a kind of a godsend because I have developed my, my Google Drive and my Microsoft Forms so much this year. And the capacity to share stuff is so good this time um, that it really works. And, and then if I can just say business for a second, we use a book and that, you know, that I'm going to complain about the books for Leave and Start Business. There isn't a bad one anymore. You know, that's, it used to be years ago, it was really easy. There was one or two good books. And now there's a bunch of really good books out there. Um, but I get them to leave their book at home all the time. I don't use the book in school at all for no better reason than, than they're carrying so many of these big books in school in the, every day and they're really, really heavy. And I just get them to do the reading part at home and we do all the other parts in school. Yeah. I think, I think you know, maybe a point that I was always told and, and you just sort of might allude to this to yourselves is, is look at the student's timetable before you decide what way you're going to teach. And if you know the teacher the students had before you is the teacher that's been making them write for the last 40 minutes because they're English and you have to learn your poems off by heart, don't give them another writing task. You know, give them that opportunity, as Maria would say, to maybe go outside and say, well, look, guys, this is what we're doing today. Or to have an activity where they're up off their feet or doing something like that. And I always love that notion of, of you're beginning to see the day through the students, you know, through the students' eyes. And if you can tweak yours at the right time, they begin to look forward to your class, no matter whether it's at the start of the day or at the end of the day. And, it's something I always brought in. I try and have a really lively lesson if I know I'm first up for them. At uh, the last day, it's, it's always a, how are you feeling, guys? What do you want to do? And then we, we'll adjust it around. And so, you know, it's always nice, I, I think, to have more than one way to teach a particular topic. And I think that's very important for, for any community. 
sorry sorry to interrupt there i that's a, that's fantastic that that idea of like you know watching where where is the student coming from rather than you know why is the student not you know assessing to what i need um i suppose one of the other things in terms of resources that we don't see enough is that we are resources for each other mm -hmm. and you know this is one of the things i suppose i really miss about the um face to face cpd um, you know, there's some of those sort of, now this is a more, I suppose I'm talking about economics. There's, there's some of those legends of economics that are actually out there, like James O'Connor, Siobhan O'Sullivan, um, Carolyn Marin, you know, Patty, you know, um, so, you know, all these people that you, you, you give you ideas, you know, you, you have the chat. And um, I do miss that side of things because um, we're a very small group in economics. So uh, we, we tend to sort of, I suppose, uh, be very uh, self-reliant. And that's why I'm delighted that the, I, I'm sorry, I don't know who administrates that Facebook group, but thank you so much that you do because it's absolutely fantastic. And it's really a, a wonderful thing. And um, um, there's, there's um, I suppose, lots of, um, you know, people that are, are out there that are, you know, assisting teachers and helping them uh you know uh, and and especially new teachers and i suppose pmes but i would say to pmes and i always say it to them uh don't be afraid um of uh you know using your um your your the, the teachers you're working with um and 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 you know getting some ideas while you're actually on placement because sometimes you learn uh, some gems that will actually stick stick with you i know that certainly happened with me i was very lucky Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I suppose the next question I think ties in quite with this, and we, we, we maybe try and keep this nice and short. And listen, shameless plugs if you want them, guys, because I know that these that, that, that are all very active in, in some of the stuff that you share. But where, where do you source your information, or where, do you, where is the best place for new teachers to source some of their information? So, again, Joel, maybe we'll come back to you on that. Again, look, Mairead, Mairead has mentioned a couple of things like, you know, other, other teachers, that's really important. And um, talked about online as well, you know, at the moment, like, you know, Twitter, Twitter, for example, if you're, you know, there's a great source of material right now. And um, you're probably aware that I'm at the moment, I'm kind of administering a teacher's collaboration folder as well in relation to business. And again, there's quite a lot. I think that link has gone to kind of lost track this it's it's well over 300 probably nearly 400 teachers at this stage not that it's that many resources there not 400 anyway but that's another growing area and i'm always happy to have people contribute to that and um, you know so I, I think what we've seen you know in the last couple of years is look there's a, there's a lot more collaboration i think it's a fact as well that um, courses and specifications have changed you know people yeah. have realized that there's there's a lot more need for it perhaps but technology facilitates that as well you know um, so a, a lot, a lot has, has improved. But and again, BSTI was mentioned at the start. I have to say, you know, I've always found it enormously valuable. You know, I have to say, every year the presentations that are put on are fantastic. You get you get a lot of insight, and even for the bits that like nobody can can do everything themselves. You know, you can't be at every course, you can't correct every exam, you can't get all that insight. But it's great to listen to people who have it because they're willing to share. You know, and it's. It, it's, it's huge if you, can, if you can get involved in that. I don't, I don't think I've come away from a BSTAI event and, and look, obviously I have a little bit of skin in the game on this one, but it, it, you know, you, you've, you've seen maybe someone like Phil Curry or, or Dalton Henry or, or Michael or yourself, Joe, at the JCD events. And, you know, I, I'm like, I've sat through this lecture before and yet I'll still walk away from the next one going, I didn't know that. And I didn't know that. And, and it is incredible. Um, Michael, in relation to you then, and again, Look, I'm going to have to say it for him because I probably know you won't, but Michael's got a great website called egs.ie forward slash business forward slash accounting, and they're great. Michael, is there any other ones that you would use? Um, most of the ones, you know, um, the two teachers, one in England, uh, Phil Curry's, yeah, the, I, I absolutely love Twitter. I love even, there's um, the video downloaders on Twitter. You know, there's just so many of these little great one minute videos you get um, and there's little thing you can, little app you get and there's a video downloader and hey Presto, you've got it, you know, you drop it into your Google Drive and it's ready to show to a class. Um, Joe's folder, um, Phil's website, um, uh, Gavin Duffy's stuff, you know, it just, it, it just brilliantly goes on and on and on. Um, and I just, I just have such a delight i would say in following so many people on twitter um uh like it has it has become such a generous rules i remember I was, to diverge for a second, i remember years ago to a, going to um 
uh, a meeting and somebody was presenting resources on something and they had them on a Moodle. And then they told us we wouldn't be able to get at them because they were locked behind their Moodle. And you're kind of going, oh, why are we here? And then karma kicked in because they were using somebody else's computer and they didn't know their password. So we had a whole hour of a lecture, uh, of workshop on resources that we couldn't access. And it just seemed so poignant, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I made a decision I was never going to hide anything again. I think I have, because it doesn't hurt me in any shape or form. And it actually benefits me because if I produce stuff and it's crap, and it comes back to me that it's crap, well, then I improve it. You know, I'm, you don't do this stuff because you're brilliant. You're, you're building these resources because I'm not doing a good enough job in the first place. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and then you get the feedback from other people and you find the ones that work and you move on with it. And, you know, the sharing of stuff is just, it's just awesome. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're at a very lucky time now with, in, in relation to that. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose I'd echo everything you'd say there. I suppose if I had one little caveat maybe for some for some of the PMEs and AQTs is there is now so much information out there. And, I mean, I think as teachers we become nerds for information. We love finding out as much as we can. Um, I, I, for me, I like to consider myself a bit of a gatekeeper with some of the information and sources that I would give the students. Because if I give my students 10 or 12 different resources, I find that they go off and they say, well, you know, Joe Stafford said this on his website, Michael Galligan said that on his website, and which one is right? And I'm like, well, well they're both right. You know, Michael's right because I don't have a website. <laughs> <laughs> what, a re what a reason to be right. <laughs> then, we, we use your book in my classroom, Joe. So, you know, if, if they're linking up that. And I'm like, different types of websites that have come on the students are getting a lot of this and, and I suppose maybe to just be it's, it's great to have the information but but just make sure you, again you can you can channel it and you can deliver it in, in the right I way. see somebody so, in the chat mentioning uh, Jason Ryan's web um, uh, no, Jason Ryan's right. website and it's yeah. it's class and yeah, yeah. I, can I, I can just um, say for for economics um uh Jeremy Canning on on uh, Twitter and on um Facebook is fantastic he 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 posts the most amazing stuff and uh, Fiona McCallion as well is brilliant um if anybody wants to to follow them they're they're just great and there's great resources from the PDST. Um, that's one thing I, I found when, when I used to have a classroom before we were all going around the place. But when the time comes again for classrooms, the PDST produced these fabulous economics um, posters and they, you know, they will be available again. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And, and we'll have that. And I, another thing for PMEs to keep in mind, again, when you're making your questions, um, it, it's always a good idea to start entering little competitions and stuff like the Young Economist of the Year. Uh, Rachel O'Farrell's um, started that a number of years ago and it's grown exponentially and it's really, really popular and students just love it. And also with the new um, research project, it really um, bears fruit when you have students who would have um, gone through the young campus of the year in TY and then you bring them to, to a senior cycle and they really know how to do their research. Just a few points. Oh, and the last thing, if, if you're teaching um, economics to Irish, the best um, uh, person to follow out there is David Graney with Achnam Yath Gilt Lushtalim Ni. Um, and his, um, he, he, he uh, shares the most fabulous stuff in the most beautiful Irish. So um, if you're teaching to Irish, um, he's the guy. Will you pronounce that like you're fluent Irish yourself there? Okay. Are you wrong in saying that? He's a grill. <laughs> I could take me half an hour to get that right. Yeah. Right, Ref, just one last point. Just Skull, Skullnet obviously is yeah. definitely worth mentioning there as well. There's like an absolutely vast amount of resources in there if you just go and search for them for any subject. Let mm -hmm. Don't forget that. Again, I think if any of you guys, if you go on to the BSTAI website, BSTAI.ie, You'll see all the links to different resources, the YouTube channels they have, and it goes across all the subjects, accounting, business, and economics as well. So, so that's a great one there. Okay. Uh, okay. This might be hopefully a nice, short, quick one that we can get in and out of. Uh, what's your favorite topic to teach? Michael, I'll come to you for that one. Favorite topic to teach in accounting? Uh, two, actually. Sorry to double up. Yeah. Uh, I've, um, I'm totally and utterly besotted by question five. Love question five. Uh, question five to a layman. Question like five. Question five is the interpretation of accounts, which everybody is afraid of. And I was, I'd say, 15 years terrified and horrified of it. And then just a couple of coincidences, things started changing. And I absolutely love it now. 
And I, I also love suspense accounts, which is a question on fixing errors. It's to me, it's the ultimate pure double entry. And some people love to teach accounting through notes and I just can't do that. I can get the numbers in the right order, but I can't figure out the plus and minus bit. Um, so I do it all through double entry and suspense is for that, absolutely. And on the flip side, absolutely detest with every fiber of my body um, <laughs> absorption and job costing. I just think that is a topic from hell. <laughs> okay. Can I interject there and just say to, just for people that are out there seeing as Michael is saying that he loves question five, Michael is facilitating a workshop after Easter in question five. Can I just point that out to people if they did want to get a bit of an insight into why Michael loves question five? Question five for newly qualified teachers and people who don't like question five. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Sorry, I'll shut up again. Sorry. <laughs> Mairead, what about you then? What's your favourite topic to teach? Um, I, I suppose like a lot of economics teachers, I just love the micro. I just love the energy and the action and the graphs and, you know, and the, and the, the uh, everything associated with the micro side. Um, I also uh, love the, uh, I, I love macro as well, but there's amount of um, sort of funneling that you have to do to get students not to waffle in it. You know, every student comes in in fifth year thinking they know everything about uh, you know various topics whether it be and they but they're used to just waffling away in their own little little world so you know there's amount of training before that actually becomes a beautiful area as well um, but I suppose in in reality what I love is any topic that I I've developed an activity um, with over the years so I love the, the my Oreos the law of diminishing yes. marginal utility um, activity um, I also have an LDMR one for those people who might be following me on Twitter might have actually spotted that one where I get the rugby uh, team basically to um, to do push-ups and um, uh, you, you'll have to see it I'll have to demonstrate <laughs> it because it's quite complex but I love those and to be honest with you um, there's nothing about economics I don't like but I have to say the hardest part about it is trying to um, I think since the new project has come in, um, there, there may be a feeling there that it might be easier to do or easier to get higher marks, not recognizing that, that there are complex areas and there are you know, areas of, you know, in other words, the, the content is still going to be the same, even though the project is there. So um, we have a, a flood apparently of, of, um, uh, of interest. Um, we, always, uh, you know, do, we always have a lot of interest in Glenstall in economics and the boys do very well and they're very, very interested in it. Um, but apparently, uh, countrywide, I'm being told that there is an up, an uptake. Um, but I, I just have to hasten to add that it's not that the course is easier, um, but it certainly it has become more attractive to an awful lot more students. I like that point you made there about you know your favourite topic to teach is often ones where you're there. I say best, you know, you've got a really cool activity coming into it like that. It, it, I mean. I love it. I, I, I'm nearly excited wanting to jump through certain chapters when I know one of my activities like that is coming up. Um, Joe, for you, your favourite topic? Your favorite topic? Um, like Mike, I'm probably between two. I, I really like the kind of ethics, social responsibility stuff, but I also, probably complete opposite, I also like the ratios. I like that kind of, you know, um, monitoring the business ratio analysis stuff. So they're my probably two favourites for leaving their business. And do you mind me asking, Joe, sorry, ratio analysis, I, I, I bring that up to my students and they go, I hear, sir, good luck to you. I, 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 I mean, it's, dare I say, it's not a very sexy one within the business course. Any, any particular reason? No, I just, you said favourite topic. I, I just like teaching it. Yeah. Maybe they don't like, I mean, maybe they don't like it as a topic, <laughs> but, but I, I, I like teaching it. You like teaching, yeah, I suppose it's a definitive bit. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, right. Uh, I suppose if we can, again, maybe keep this... This, I think this came in regard, if this one could have been for you, Michael, what's the hardest part about teaching your subject? I think they, they ticked accounting for it. Is there anything particularly hard about it? I'm going to answer you slightly sideways, sorry. Um, I did a couple of, a bit of work with PME's uh, methods for a couple of years ago with the, in DCU with the part-timers and I was reminded of something we all knew once and I think we've all forgotten as accountancy teachers. It's really, really hard to start teaching accounting because if you've not done it for your leave insert, you've gone off and you've done your fancy um, auditing, you've done your fancy finance and you've done your fancy taxation and then you walk into a leave insert and all of us didn't have a clue how to do the questions, never mind teach them. Uh, in the beginning and as often as not um, 
you're the only teacher in the you're the only accountancy teacher in the school if it's a small school and you've probably just re replaced the beloved Mr. X or Mrs. X who was the greatest accountancy teacher in the history of the world and knew how to do everything and and you're sitting there and there's questions in front of you that you don't know how to do never mind how to teach and there's workings you don't know how the hell they got that answer um, and I want to say that because to me that's the hardest thing about teaching accounting that I would say almost terror that you have when you're starting out that you don't know what the hell you're doing. Uh, and the reason I want to take advantage of it here is to say that that's absolutely normal. Um, and that's why part of the things on me on website, there's place for questions and there's stuff like Twitter. And, you know, I'd like to reassure people who walk into a job that um, when you're starting off like that and you're, and you're, you know, you're standing in front of a class and there's an adjustment you just do not have a notion how to do. And you either have a choice, do I spoof it or do I turn around and go, listen, lads, I'm really, I'm sorry. I do not want to do, know what to do next. I'll know tomorrow. You know, and there isn't one of us who hasn't stood there as particular, I don't know, probably as an economics teacher too, less I find it as a business teacher. Um... But uh, things I've, I, I, in the past, I'm, I'm glad to say it happens less, uh, a lot less. But there have been times I have had to go and, you know, the, the ground is opening in, on you and you just want to fall into a hole and disappear. And you have to go, listen, lads, I'm sorry, I, I do not know what to do next. Yeah. You know, uh, because all you do is you just upset everybody and confuse everybody when you try and go through. And all I want to say is, to me, that was the hardest thing about accounting. I had forgotten it. I saw it, the other people suffering it. Um, and I would like anybody, because we're talking to PMEs and NQTs here, I'd like them to know that that is something everybody else is going through and it's something we all went through and it will pass. But it doesn't mean you're the rubbish person you might think you are because you're not getting it. And I think, I, I think the point you made there, a lot of students respect that. When you just say, guys, you know what, we, mm. we, we park with that and I'll come back better Have tomorrow to. with that. And, and yeah, I, I think you win a lot of students that way. Okay, I'm going to move on, try, try to go to another question. Again, just very conscious of the time now because um, we're, we're about an hour in and, and, I, and I hope that, that the people are still hanging in there. Uh, in relation to, oh, this is quite an interesting question. Um, I, and I'll ask actually both Mairead and Joe on this one. Do you think you must do leave insert corrections in order to become a better teacher? Uh, Joe, I'll start with you and then Mairead will come to you from the economics point of view. So Joe, from a business point of view? Because it says must, I'm saying no, but I definitely think it helps. You get you get great insight. I have done it for both junior and, and leave insert down the years. And like you, you certainly get a great insight in terms of the marking scene and the exam bit. I, I wouldn't say necessarily making you a, a better teacher. I mean... If we're focused on the exam, sure, that insight is, is really important. But in terms of your day-to-day -day classroom practice, you know, we're, we're into a, <laughs> a bigger conversation here about what am I, what, you know, what am I teaching to? Am I, am I teaching to a syllabus or am I just teaching to a test? But look, you certainly get invaluable insight. So I definitely would recommend everybody to do it at some point. Yeah. I don't think you have to do it forever. To get that insight, I think if you do it for a few years, I think you, you probably get as much insight as, 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 as you need. Right. what about you for economics? Yeah, I have to say, um, I agree there with um, with Joe that, um, you know, obviously uh, being an excellent teacher is quite separate, uh, you know, in, in lots of ways, and because you can absolutely be a, an excellent teacher without uh, without ever correcting. Um, however, what I found from uh, from correcting is that it gives you a, a new insight into where the focus, where the marks are, where the actually, it, rather than where the marks are gained, you find the nuanced ways in which the marks are actually lost. Mm. And that actually can actually be far more informative um, in mm. your practice. In other words, you can find out that, well, this student needed to write way less. They, they, they had it, you know, at the, after the second sentence, they had full marks. So you, you learn techniques in ways um, to, to sort of, uh, I, I suppose, navigate your students. So mm. I would have, you know, come back from marking and straight modified my, basically my entire set of notes. Uh, so that my notes not only reflect, I suppose, the, 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 the teaching and the methodologies, but they also reflect, uh, you know, a very exam focus on what, um, you know, what is actually needed in order to get the grades. And you would be surprised in economics, the things that uh, are marked down and marked up. Yeah, I like that. So, yeah, I think the consensus there is 
give it a go at some stage. You know, Absolutely. it's not going to define you as a teacher, but 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 there's certainly a lot of benefits that come from Absolutely. it. Okay. Uh, I think we've kind of answered this quite quite a bit. A lot of us have our own notes, so I'm going to skip along with this one. And apologies to whoever sent in that. Um, do you use your textbooks in the class? I think a lot of us will use it as, as a reference point, but we tend to, to maybe have a little bit more ownership from, from what we're doing ourselves, okay? Uh, this, this final one here, I think, on the teaching before we move on to the new topic of assessment. Um, this was definitely a business question. So, Joe, this one was back to you. How do you, gay, how do you engage fifth years who do not seem interested in, in the subject? probably answered a bit of this already. I just think with those students, you really have to get them actively engaged. So, you know, as I said, using news articles, co current stuff to link the theory, maybe perhaps even starting with the, the current news piece, you know, so that's going to be your, your way in because you want to get them on site before you, you bombard them with the theory. So you're connecting it in that way. And as I said, you really need to have those students act. I, I would say when I, I don't necessarily just mean writing, but I definitely mean, you know, active in a, in a class, whether it's, it's, it's making their own notes, etc. because uh, I think that if they're not that engaged, they're, they're just going to drift. They're certainly not going to sit there and listen to you lecture them for, for 30 minutes, you know? Yeah. Um, so so you, you want those students really to be as hands-on as possible, you know, and, and as I said, engage them with kind of real world content. Um, and there's a lot of it now, you, you know, you can, I mean, some of the stuff we talked about, maybe some of the approaches that we're kind of using maybe a little bit at, at junior cycle, but like there is just as applicable at, at senior cycle, especially for students when you want to try and interest and engage them. I think that's really important. I, I, I always, I mean, I mean, I teach, for anybody who doesn't know, I, I, we teach a repeat leave insert in the college that I work in. Um, so a lot of my students might be 17, 18, 19 years of age up to, I've had students 55 and 60, but what I find is if you know your students and you have one that is disengaged, you be, because business is a subject that's full of examples, you can just bring in whatever their favorite thing is as that example. So if you're talking about leadership and they follow a football team, you can say, look, it's kind of like this. Now, any example might want you to use a business example, but you do that. Ethics, you bring in something around ethics that would relate to them. And I think that that, that can help yeah. them. But, but yeah, yeah. It, it, I've actually used, um, I, I get my fifth years to do group projects in, in, in ethics. <laughs> you know, they do a research project and I, I give them a list of topics and uh, they work in threes and fours and then they can choose one themselves and they, they work on it for three or four days and then they come and they just present it to the class and it gets them very engaged. Yeah. And, you know, I said, I'd like that. Now, again, you know, this comes back to the, the previous question. They're not going to be asked to do that in the exam, but I still do it because I think it gives them invaluable insight mm -hmm. and it lets them actually see how organisations can be ethical or unethical. You know, and it does get them really kind of hands on and, and lets them see that this is the real world. And sometimes, you know, you, you can pick some of the companies that they're very familiar with, uh, brands that they use, and all of a sudden they realize, hang on, maybe this company wasn't as squeaky clean as I thought, you know. So, again, that's definitely going to engage them. Yeah, mm. get, get them so, in. Okay, thank you very much. All right. I think, uh, I think okay. engagement, sorry, I think engagement can exist in different sorts of ways as well. If you tie it back to people who have corrected, people who have corrected off be really good at presenting information that, for an exam purpose, is really, really targeted and really, really focused. And... If that helps students to succeed, then the actual act of succeeding helps to bring them in as well. You know, so sometimes I'm not saying you have to dump loads of exams and things on them, but it gives people opportunities to do better than they expected. You know, and sometimes when you have a situation where a student gets a 45 in a test and they get a 47 in a test and they get a 46 in a test and they think they're the bee's knees because they got a 53 you know, so they 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 prejudge and, and they def they overly define themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're able to take them and even within a class test say, look, you know, you can't jump from a forty six to an eighty five. Um, they they can start thinking about themselves and they start judging their 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 degree of of integration with the class in a completely different light. Yeah. You know, it's all, it's all fair point. Okay, so um, I'm going to tr again try try and go through a little bit quicker here. So maybe in in, in a couple of words, um, Mairead, I'll come to you. How often do you give homework? Um, well, I suppose the the straightforward answer to that up the school would be as in sort of uh, from first year on would be every night. I mean, I would give homework every every night. I teach every every day. I teach. I would give uh, some element of homework. Um, as we move up the school, um, what I would do would be, I would, you know, on Google Classroom, I would set the dates maybe for a couple of days later if, if I felt they needed a couple of days in order to, to, to sort of achieve it. 
But my general rule is, um, uh, I suppose, uh, that that it would be every night. You know, particularly, you know, as you as you you start in fifth year, um, because the, the the practice of of doing work is something that um, becomes ingrained. And if they they're not in the practice of doing questions, and you know, and sometimes, to be honest with you, I think. Um, uh, what I would I, I do try and do in fifth year is I try and make the homework interesting. Okay, so what I would do is like let's say for example, um, with my uh, fifth years when we might go into to a topic that might be um, not the most uh, interesting for them. What I do is I bring in something some small little piece of homework on an area that they would find interesting, like a. I, I did a piece with them before Christmas on uh, donut economics. You know, they loved that. They found that fascinating. And, you know, again, then when we were talking about economic growth, they were able to refer back to donut economics and talk about the, the you know, the conflict in terms of the ideas and um, how this ever uh, lasting, uh, you know, economic growth, uh, you know, conflicts with the idea of donut economics. So, you know, in, in that way, um, it, it's, a, it's a powerful tool, homework. And it also gives them time to reflect and also students get, get a chance to give a little bit extra, um, you know, when they're when they're at home, you know, maybe an extra work, an extra, you know, half an hour at economics if they love it, um, which you often find they do. And that brings them even you know, further along, which I find very good, engages them well. Uh, Michael, Joe, what about you? I'd say always, but not always written. Um, you know, sometimes it could be reading and sometimes I'll actually use it that if I know I'm going to use a topic or a news article the next day, that might be the homework. So they have to go and just read that or even some of it. And that's where we begin the conversation next day. So it, would, it wouldn't be written all the time. Um, but I again would say every day there's an understanding in the class that whatever's covered that day, because I'm not reading book page by page, that these are the key headings they have to do. Um, again, Michael alluded to that. There's the books at home. They've got to do the reading, I feel like, you know, and, and then we do the follow up in class. Okay, and Michael, are you anything different? Are you, are you an everyday type of guy? Uh, I'm going to mention both accounting and business. For the accounting, I would tend to give a, a lot of written, a lot of written homework, but not even just fractions of questions, because I I saw this great quote once: uh, and "Practice doesn't make perfect; practice makes permanent." Mm -hmm. um, it's only perfect practice that makes perfect. Um, so I'd want them doing small pieces and probably trying to do those small pieces well, rather than doing big pieces and hoping to get half of it right. Um, and for business, hardly ever, hard, especially in fifth year, hardly ever give it. I'm switching more and more into forms, but as we had, I had talked to you before in an interview thing before, I really would never get them to write out sentences if they're answering questions. I just get them to write down the, the, the word or phrase necessary for the, um, the state, the two word or phrases necessary for the explain and a word or phrase necessary for the illustrate. And I don't even have to really understand their answer because I'm far more concerned with what they have to say in fifth year than how they have to say it. Plus, and I'll, I'll admit this, I will straight up admit, I am the laziest human being when it comes to correcting business because it's just so incredibly boring to correct it. So if I can correct it by reading 10 words as opposed to a paragraph or a page i'll take that every time i love i i, I adopted that this year michael I've, I've, I've no problems in saying that um gives my students a very focus to to write less in their homework and that's the whole thing that i'm giving my students now i need that those keywords and that's it if you're writing any more mm. and they'll thank you for it too yeah and the, the feedback has been great because they've wondered what's gone on and i said watch what watch, watch the video that i did with a guy called michael gallagher and we'll see so Okay, uh, next up is, right, I think we've covered this, you have any fun ways of assessing students and we've spoken about that, so I'm happy enough to move on. Um, how often do you assess your students test-wise? And again, maybe very quickly in a word or two, would you give a test at the end of every chapter? Joe? I tend to do two chapters every together. Chapters so. you get a test? I give a test every week. You give a test every week, Marie. Gosh, Marie, homework every night, a test every week. Well, the homework, <laughs> the homework is towards the test. You know, it, the homework is often learning homework. And so <laughs> the test would be every week. Yeah, in sixth year, yeah, they would have a test every week. It would be, um, and then you you would have, a, you know, they would have a very, very clear view. Also, you see, I, I, it sounds like I'm torturing them, but in fact, actually, I'm torturing myself. Yeah. Um, oh, in reality, I suppose the, the way I viewed this, and this will, would have been uh, a tip I picked up, like I can't remember from whom it was, but it would have been somebody in the BSTI years ago. Um, uh, 
um, that when I was starting teaching and I'd just come out of my um, PME and um, they were actually saying how they found that they had they had gone from uh, end of chapters to, to a week and um, because it was easier for students to actually grasp a small amount. So what I uh, what I would do is I would it would be a small section. It wouldn't even be a full chapter, but and it would be a small assessment. But the, the work would be done, it would be embedded, and it would be reinforced. And then by the time it came to the chapter end, you know, and that would be at the end of one week, um, they have, they've done it in piecemeal. So you're, you're, you're feeding it in bite-sized pieces yeah. to the students. And I design the assessments in such a way that they're very kind of um, user-friendly and easy to correct as well. Um, but they, they, they do know they have a weekly test. It's always on a Monday. So um, if it was on a Friday, my weekend would be ruined. So it's on. Uh, you know, it's, it's a nice strategy of doing that for my leave inserts now, but only because we're doing our revision topics on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And if I gave it to them for the second class on the Wednesday, they wouldn't have had time to revise it. So by default, we've gone for Monday. But I like your notion of not ruining my weekend as well by putting yeah. it on Monday. So. Yeah, that's good. Michael, for, did, did, did I ask uh, you? My business, I'd say almost weekly. But what I tend to do is I ask long questions that produce short answers as opposed to the other way around. Mm -hmm. So I will give a definition and they've got to write down what it's a definition of as opposed to me asking for a definition. And then what we do is we swap it around the class. Whoever's at the test, their name is on the top. Whoever corrects it puts their name on the bottom. There's absolutely no mess in everywhere. There's no ambiguity. There's no hands. Yeah, this is on there. So, you know, that's, is, that, is, that the, is that what they said? No, right, that's it. And we can have a test done and, a, and it corrected probably in 20 minutes. I love, I love that. You know? And then for accounting, I'm going to hold this up. They did this today with a fifth year class. And I don't know if it'll show up. All right. Um, you see the three little boxes, hang on, I'm trying to see the three little boxes at the top. Yeah. I actually give them a marking scheme. And uh, if they've got, they don't highlight their own work, they highlight the marking scheme in one of three colors. Now today all they had to do was fill in the entries on this cash, but they didn't have to do the net cash stuff. They just had to go down to where those yellow things go. Now the pink entries are what this person has done wrong. The yellow entries are what this person has done right. Okay, now this person has been out unwell with anxiety and came back literally as this topic was starting was very worried about um staying with the class now what i'm looking at there is a person who has done fantastically well all right and they've got one error in there they're on the same line so they've made one mistake and if, you know to get that perfect they need to fix one thing um there's no missing figures in there. I don't know. I don't know what the percentage is. I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it as to turn it into a percentage, but that's an assessment. I'd call that a, a formative assessment. Uh, I wouldn't want to be trying to judge a, a, a percentage accumulate accredited grade on it, but I've taught that person that they're really good at this. Yeah. It's a beautiful visual that Michael, to you know, see that. Um, yeah. And then what they do, and the really thing I like about it is, if they hadn't finished, there was another person didn't finish on time, the two bottom rows were filled in in the missing color. Now you can't fill in an empty space on your, on, on your own work because it's not there. But if you've got a marking scheme, that you can go back to in six months time and you can see what you are uh, weak on and, and what you're good on. And rather than trying to relearn the whole thing from scratch all over again, you can go, how did I get that line wrong? Why did I not finish that line? Maybe at the bottom. And you can get a meaningful um, revision strategy or improvement strategy out of it. Brilliant, brilliant. And I don't have to correct it because I got them to do it in class. Yeah, yeah that peer-to-peer -peer learning is, is, is excellent. Uh, how do you raise your work? Do you follow your markets? I think you've spoken enough maybe about this in terms of maybe using our best judgments. Would that be the common theme? Would a lot of you revert back to marking schemes? I mean, Marie, you said yours was kind of a, a nearly a, a short test itself. So you're not really thinking of marking schemes. It's what your answer is, isn't it? Um, well, you, I, I would make a marking scheme um, all the time. You know, say for example, you know, uh, if it was just a, you know, a, a, a definition test or something like that, or a calculation test or something. But I certainly would give them a mark. You know, I, but it may not be, a, you know, out of hundred or specific marking scheme. Um, I use rubrics a lot. Um, you know, when I'm, uh, you know, doing. Let's say, for example, I found them very useful. Um, 
uh, I suppose, coming towards the latter stage, you know, fr from when they were um, initiating their research and stuff, um, because it gave them a clear idea as to, I suppose, in lots of ways, uh, as to regards their, their weaker areas and the areas that needed a little bit more work. Um, but in terms of, um, and could I just, in case I'm thinking I'm giving every single class in the whole school a week, a, a test every week. It's not, it, the sixth years would be getting a, a weekly test and then an end of chapter test. The fifth years, it'll be an end of, cha end of chapter test, you know, just to, you know, you just couldn't do, otherwise you'd be just marking all the time. Yeah, yeah. Joe, Joe, what were you there? You use marking schemes and, or and, a mix. I would it sometimes it just depends on the test, but I definitely would comment. I think probably the most important thing for students is getting getting the feedback in terms of the comment bit. You know, I think that especially early on that you know there's a value maybe not always just giving them a mark or percent, but definitely giving them feedback in terms of the answer. And I would definitely do that. That's probably one of the harder bits. Actually, talk about what the, one of the hard bits of the job that bit and, and trying to, to get that right. Uh, it gets a little bit easier, I suppose, over time. You're used to knowing what you're looking for. And that also, I suppose, goes back to the question about marking exams. You know, again, part of that insight, we are talking about maybe our best judgment, but our best judgment of what's required might be based on the experience that we have, obviously, down the years and also marking exams. So the two of those are very much linked. Yeah. But I think the feedback, rather than just the percentage, like telling students, especially in fifth year, what a good answer looks like is more important than telling them they got 52. Yeah. I also like the comments as well as a chance to, to make that connection with the student about, you know, well done, you're doing great so far this year and stuff. And I, I've often nearly wrote a longer comment than they have an exam paper. So I, <laughs> I see that. Uh, okay, um, I'm not going to do this question here. So again, my apologies, whoever sent that in. I'm just conscious of the time. We're now into some general questions. And again, I've answered this one pretty much the hardest part of teacher subject. I think it came a little bit earlier. Uh, this one actually came through just to me and um, some people have been asking me on Twitter what's QQI uh, because it's actually on my, my bio. Um, QQI stands for Quality Qualifications Ireland uh, and, and the only reason why I said I'd bring this into this conversation is for any PMEs um, who are going to, to qualify, obviously finding a job can be quite difficult. Um, QQI falls under the umbrella of further education. Um, and, and that means that if you're a qualified business teacher, you could teach kind of QQI levels five, level six, which is kind of five, well, even level four, level five, level six. And uh, so, for example, on my timetable, I would teach subjects like um, entrepreneurship, marketing practice, digital marketing, business management. And a lot of them are business orientated subjects. Um, and, and again, you have to be registered with the teaching council. So I suppose for anybody asking, you don't necessarily, and I don't want to say the word pigeonhole yourself into secondary schools, but there, there, there are, don't be afraid to look at, at further education colleges when they are looking for business teachers. The best way I can describe it is that a QQI level five student, regardless of the module you teach, if it's marketing or something like that, is probably about a H4 student. Um, that's kind of the level you're trying to teach towards, a H4, maybe a H3. And then as you go on to level six, you're really looking at your H1 students and maybe a little bit past that. So content wise, the subjects are brilliant, but it's just maybe that other avenue than your standard secondary school. And, and look, if, if I forget who put that on to me. If I haven't answered your question or if anybody would like to find out a little bit more, there's obviously the QQI website, but I'll, um, I'll have a chat with you on that as well. Um, and just, just conscious of the time. So, so thank you for that. Uh, I think this is the last of the general ones is if you're going to teach a subject for the first time and again now it, it's coming up on half eight and I kind of want to be able to wrap it up there um, so maybe I'll start with you Michael any just quick advice for teaching counting for the first time? Oh okay there are a couple of things some are kind of politically correct you do need to get your hands on some sort of a scheme you, you do need to, the, my first job I got the interview on Friday and was told I was starting Monday and they handed me a leave and cert business book and I hadn't done leave and cert business myself and the first class I had on Monday morning was a sixth year class taken over and I think I spent three months doing communication and thank God it came up a couple of times <laughs> um, so you do need to get you know ask one of us like we all have schemes of work if you're starting off somewhere and, you, and you've got and I know making your own notes is better but you're not going to make your own notes on day one so you know if anybody ever needs a scheme you know where to find me you're more than welcome to it and the rest was i'm sure the same too it'll just give you some sort of a guideline of of a direction okay the other thing i would do is and this is less politically correct is 
I would look at the past marking schemes for papers and I'll tell you why. Um, the fact of the matter is for many people, they are going on to university and things like that. It's not an issue of whether they should or shouldn't be, but for most of the country, they still are. We do have a responsibility to try and get them through that particular exam. Yes, we have an a responsibility to educate them, but we also have a responsibility to get them to maximize their results in the exam. And if you don't know what the exam is about, you're not going to know to a fair extent how to deal with it. So you need something, I think, to give you a guideline, get yourself a marking scheme from, not a marking scheme, get yourself a scheme of work from somebody and, and start changing, you know, even just follow it uh, for the moment to start off with and then start changing it. But also, Pay attention to the topics and the, and the past paper breakdown of how they come up and things like that so that you know, like we've all, there are things I've changed because I found out afterwards I was teaching them wrong. You know, and, and, and there isn't a teacher alive who isn't in that situation. There were te definitions we were teaching and we discovered they basically were not getting full marks. There was ways of doing an accountancy calculation we were teaching and we discovered they were not getting full marks. And we've changed that because we went and looked at marking schemes and we looked at part papers and our students did better as a consequence of those changes. Thank you. Uh, Mairead, maybe in a word or two, any advice that you could give to, to students? Well, I would say um, get organized get planning and um, even if you're only starting in September, I would I would open up my Google Sheet now and get started um, because you're going to pick up lots of resources that you can actually slap in at this stage. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose fundamentally and lastly, what I would say is as a teacher, you are the leader in the classroom. So you need to know the way, show the way and go the way. Very well put, yeah. Thank you very much. Joe, what about you? Any, any, any quick advice? Again, most of what was said there, I, I would also say, have a look at the syllabus or specification as well. I think that's important. Um, you know, it, it might surprise you even, you know, um, even looking at leaving their business, like there, 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 is, a, there is a syllabus document uh, and it can be quite insightful in terms of what's involved, um, you know, and it might necessarily dovetail exactly with what you might see in a textbook. So sometimes it's useful just to get your hands on that. Also, I agree, like you do need to look at a marking scheme at the other end, but I suppose there, there are two ends of that spectrum and you probably need to look at both of them. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we have, oh, I don't know if any of these can be yes or no answers, but if they can, I'd appreciate it because we do have a few in the Q&A. Uh, this is starting with accounting. For you, Michael, those abbreviations do in the presentations of accounts, NNL for light and heat? In truth, I honestly don't know. I'd be inclined to put down the full thing. Um, I've never seen it docked, but the marking scheme from one year is no guarantee of the marking scheme next year. I've seen them dock for things like um, an expense due and you didn't use the word due or an expense prepaid and you didn't use the word prepaid. Now, it's obvious that they're there for that reason, but they dock for that. So if they can dock for that, they can dock for an abbreviation. Well, if I was pushed for time, I'd... I'd I wouldn't lose writing down numbers for the sake of writing down those words. Yeah. You know, if I was really stuck for time, I, I'd go for the numbers first and I'd worry about the wording second. Super. Uh, this Hopi is yes or no? Is published accounts, uh, dividend notes still on the course? I'm not actually sure what that question means. So maybe if somebody would send that to me, I will follow up on it. And um, I, I've obviously typed that in there wrong now. Doing oh, I don't think so. I'm just not 100% yeah, yeah. sure what it means. Yeah, I said, if somebody wants to send it to me, um, there's a comment section on the accounting website. If somebody wants to drop it in there and I will follow up on it and I'll put an answer. Uh, suspense accounts, would it take you long to answer that? I imagine that might be a, a, a long question. Um, I was, as I was saying before, I was thinking if next, uh, the, 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 the uh, question five happen. thing was to go well, we might start maybe think about doing the same thing because it's a, go back to those newly qualified teachers who don't know how to deal with topics. I think it might be no harm to have CPD on topics through the like of this. Um, and suspense would be often seen by most people as the other really difficult question. Okay, okay, that's brilliant. So maybe maybe you can look at that towards your account notes. So thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Joe, in relation to business then, what level of detail do you need to answer a question? From it depends on the question, I suppose. Yeah. Look, look, be guided, be guided by be guided by the outcome verb. You know, whether it's a it's a list or a state, you know, versus a, a an evaluate or discuss stuff. You know, I, I think you really have to be be guided by that. Again, interesting kind of just look 
in the context of leadership business, just look at some of those as well, which are um, higher level only as well. We're, we're noting that. Yeah, I also think that you could look maybe a bit at the, the the value of marks. Sometimes you might get twenty marks and they only want two points. Yeah, you'd imagine but, the level of detail is a bit more deep than than when it's a twenty mark with the four. Yeah, points. and whatever you do, I look generally it's it's points. I mean, again, I'm saying to students all the time that think of think of your ten marks always in just little bite sized pieces. So if you look at if you do look at a marking scheme, it's very rare anything gets more than four. So if you see 10, it's going to be a makeup of twos and threes everywhere. So you're better off giving small little bits, short two or three short sentences rather than one yeah. very long one that might even have two points in it. Because then you're you're leaving it to the discretion, let's say, of the market to decide, well, yeah, I could divide this in two and there's two points in there. Make it easy for them. Give them two short sentences. And then I, call, I call it Lego marking, building your answer up like little pieces of Lego. <laughs> Lego marking. Okay, in relation to question two, Joe, do you cover break even with ordinary level? I do, yeah, simply because, a bit like the guys I said earlier, often the decision around the level hasn't isn't made until quite late. And um, yeah. but I'm also conscious that it is it is a common syllabus for everybody. So even though we haven't seen, I think 2015 there was a short question on the ordinary level paper on break even. I, you know, I, I don't think if ever I certainly can't remember it being coming up as a long question. But again, I'm I'm teaching to the syllabus here. I'm teaching that to everybody, and um, so I, I I definitely do, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I might, I might, I might have taught it, but obviously, late on in sixth year, um, I might be emphasising other things when I know who my ordinary level students are and they're working on ordinary level papers. Let's say that the focus might change. Right? Indeed, but teach it for sure. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, right, uh, Murray, in relation to economics, I suppose are any key areas a student must know that always comes up in the economics exam? Well, because of the fact that we haven't had uh, the new exam yet, um, we, you know, it's, it's impossible to say. We would have uh, had a couple of areas that would have been, um, I suppose, key areas um, historically. Um, but I suppose it remains to be seen what's going to happen this time. But if I was a betting woman, I would imagine that it would be unlikely that we wouldn't have, you know, price mechanism and um, I suppose the markets, uh, you know, um, on on the on any paper that we're we're likely to see, um, you know, and uh, there's so much new material as well that it's unlikely that that won't be seen too. Um, the great news is that there is such a great choice in the coming paper. Yeah. And I, I imagine that, well, that one of the reasons why this might be the case is that we will be given the opportunity to see how a variety of different questions are graded in the leaving certificate. So we'll be in a much better position to, to answer that question um, in, the, in the coming year. Brilliant. And, and to wrap us up before we go to the to the live Q&A from today's session, so there's a few in there to do. Oh, Marie, you, you have kind of answered this, to be fair, but I bless this person. And um, They've been asked to teach economics next year, but have hated the subject in college. Any advice? Um, <laughs> you know, I suppose the question is, do you actually hate it or were you taught it so badly that you hate it, you know, as a reason for that? Um, we all have been in a classroom, you know, when we were when we were kids, you know, with a teacher that hated the subject they were teaching, or at least we thought they did. And it's an awful feeling as a, a student and it's palpable in the room. So, you know, if there was any way in which you could actually, you know, grow to love it or try and maybe ask to, to do a, a different subject, because it is a it is an absolutely gorgeous subject. It, and if you love it, it, it is a joy to teach. And um, I do think that if you if you did go through it in college, you may just have been put off by the, you know, maybe maybe your 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 lecturer in college. I, I don't know how to answer that other than that. I, I think you made a great point there. It's it, it's 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 how you're taught. It's is mm -hmm. almost a far more important than what you're taught. Uh, and so yeah, it's a nice way of looking at actually, Mario. I was curious as to how you're going to tackle that question that I came in. So so very well done. Okay, um. Right, guys, thanks very much. So at this stage, I think I'm going to hand it over to our chairperson, Rachel, who might have a few general Q&As and might then be able to point them in the right direction if they came in. Thank you, okay, Rachel. Um, I have answered as many of these as I could as they were coming in to try and cut down on time. So apologies to anybody if they wanted one of the panel to make, answer their question and they got an answer from me. So I'm apologising for that. Um, a lot of questions surrounding um, the Leaving Cert business scheme of work and 
there, there's one in here. I'm, I'm now only finishing unit three, halfway through the last chapter. I feel so behind, um, but also feel I needed to spend the extra time due to COVID on certain areas. Am I leaving myself short for sixth year? I hope to get through two chapters in unit four before the end of the year. Thank you very much, Joan. Yeah. For, for current sixth years. No, I'm only finished. I think I'm my on my taking of that one was that she has fifty, or this person has fifty. 50 years. Okay. I yeah, I think she's okay, but so what do you think, Joe? Yeah, should be should be fine. I mean, look, you're not going to be finished by by Christmas or sixth year, but at the end of the day, that isn't the crucial thing. The main thing is you you, you will you will you will get it done. Um, yeah, no, it's 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 doable from there. Yeah. And I think in the year that we're in, there's going to be allowances for them fifth years as well. So, yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. fair. Um, yeah. when, this again for Joe. When should we introduce students to the ABQ? Should we introduce it in fifth year? I always do some in fifth year, yeah. Yeah, same, um, same with myself. Okay, you know, like I, I, I would have an ABQ as part of my end of year assessment. Um, again, just gives me a bit of insight in terms of levels. Would you be preparing them up for the following year, Joe, or would you have taken one from a year that's gone by? It just depends on what it is, Breffney. So again, because I'm following, let's say, the units in sequence. So if, like, I'm aiming to get into, into kind of, it's only four units done. So I'm probably looking at a one, two, three, or a two, three, four ABQ. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I'll just make up my own. It just depends on what we've done in the group. But um, I'd always include one because it just gives me good insight in fact i think you know said it to you before that like in, in a two-hour end of year assessment which is what we generally would have um i would look to have a mix of short questions abq and a couple mm -hmm. of long questions where, where there's choice on you know all of it because it just gives me the insight in terms of where the students at and trying to help me and them make a decision around levels a year from from, 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 from your hands thank you um I don't really know which subject this is related to, but it's from Eamon McDevitt. Um, do, does you, does you allow, do you allow yourself room for error? For example, if you plan a unit of work will take three weeks and it takes four, how do you make that time up? Or do you give yourself room for when planning in case things don't go ahead? I think actually, Joe, you mentioned that you do have time in your plan, don't yeah, you? Yeah, so I, I generally build in kind of a gap, a little buffer where I've, maybe three or four weeks I call it catch up revision whatever that might be so so if I have a, if I have a, my scheme let's say runs up until Christmas I might have three weeks up until Christmas where I'm not planning to cover necessarily new material now sometimes it means I'm working very close up to Christmas so in our school for example we it works for me because we don't have formal Christmas exams we do have Christmas reports where they're based on continuous assessment up to that point um, so I can work right up to that so if I've if, if I've got into a topic and it's taken a bit longer. I have the same in Feb. So we have whole school exams when the mocks are on in Feb. We have whole school exams in summer. So again, I have a, a lead in time built in of two or three weeks normally that would allow me to catch up just if, if the pace drops off or sometimes just students really get into a topic, you know, and you might just spend a little bit longer on it. Okay, thank you. Um, this is from Michael. Um, do you find that students in accounting in the last few years are finding it harder, for example, to comprehend double entry, etc., due to the new junior cert business covering less accounting co concepts in the curriculum? And if so, do you do anything extra or help or different to help them? Well, as I said, we have the luxury of having brought uh, accounting as a compulsory module in transition year uh, so that everybody ex experiences it. Um, yes, there's an insecurity. I think more of the insecurity is things like in question uh, in question one, where the, the, the layout of things like trading profit and loss um, is there. The the double entry I've kind of I've I've been in a luxurious position to be able to do something about it. I think it's not that they're less off. They're, I think they're insecure because they might think they've missed something. But I also think it has worked very well from the point of view. It has opened it up to everybody. Um, I mean, the old system was, you know, it's even written in the syllabus, uh, the mature or more able student. I think that's the phrase that's used in the accounting syllabus. Now it's, it's open to everybody. And what I've just done is I've made a decision to start from scratch. You know, yes, I start back a bit. Um, I don't have the present six years, there's two of us. I have the present fifth years and... Uh, 
I'd like to have a couple of years under my belt to make a, a, a better informed decision about that. But I like the fact it allows everybody to do it if they want. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Um, that next question that's popped up, we've kind of answered it about uh, schemes of work and how we fit in if we're coming behind. The next two questions were about that, so we've kind of answered that, so I'm going to skip on over them. Um, do you find you're able to incorporate activities into a Leaving Cert class like you would a Junior Cert class, like pair work, group work, etc.? I find my fifth years look at me saying we're not children, but find myself talking more and a lecturing approach as a result. Anybody? Yeah, I, I, short answer is yes. But... Sorry, Joe, go on ahead. Yeah, I would just say short answer is yes, I do. Depends on the topic very much, but look, I'm, I'm getting students to, to, to try and be as active. I mean, I'm not necessarily doing it for 40 minutes every day, but I do think they need to be engaged. But yes, so they can do pair work and group work. I mentioned, for example, what just one I just referenced earlier was that, you know, around the area of ethics, I get my students in fifth year to do uh, a group a group project essentially they research it and they do a presentation i i would agree with you joe i think it depends on the class a lot and i i personally think you have to change your activities up from junior search you're not going to ask them to do the same things but i yeah. do think if you get the right activities it is it's all about getting the right activity there and you will get them on side and i wouldn't pers i wouldn't i wouldn't give up on it i think you need to stick with it but uh, and find the right activities that would be my take on it um, right okay sorry um how early how early you decide a student should do the higher level or ordinary level exam i'm not sure what subject that is but i think we've looked at we looked at that didn't we yeah i think they all kind of mentioned how everybody's taught higher level and you know the decision will come far later i'd say kind of around mock time maybe for a lot of people yeah i think i would i would totally agree with that um accounting what do you do to encourage students to stay away from SEC solutions? They go to them too often and it inhibits the learning. Michael. Oh, okay, so you're talking to the bloke who has all the SEC solutions on his website. Um, <laughs> who makes it easy for them to get them. <laughs> you know, I have, so I have, down, nothing, I have downloaded Mike. every single... Um, I have downloaded every single DEB pass paper and marking scheme. I have downloaded every exam craft one. I have the old Moxie ones. I ha even have many of the old uh, business studies magazines ones. It's not that hard to find other questions. And it's not that hard sometimes to change a figure here or there. Um, just to, to, you know, even from the point of view of put up, change something, put it up, and then ask the harsh question, why have you got, uh, you know, uh, why did you add two and two uh, and get 36 when the answer should have been 36, whatever it was, you know, they, they end up doing something stupid that's really easy to kind of go, um, you know, maybe the answer the question should have been 18 plus 18 equals 36, and they write down 18 plus four equals 36, and you're kind of going, how did you get that? You know, so you see that come through handy enough. Okay. Um, does Maraid have any advice for attacking the economic research project? We'll be on placement in September. So want to be prepared in case I'm asked to help out. Um, well, I suppose the, the it, it has been a steep curve. Okay, is all I can actually tell you. <laughs> um, I suppose uh, one of the things that economics um, teachers uh, have been uh I suppose, uh, looking forward to for a long time was uh, the, the fact that we would have uh, this project, which would be, uh, you know, something that we could get our teeth into and would really make, um, bring the subject alive and all the extra work we've been doing, you know, bringing our students places, you know, um, introducing um, outside resources, bringing in speakers, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, that that was going to come alive. I think the, I, I suppose it, it arrived after the, the, the extended lockdown to a group um, who had uh, been at home since March and um, in, in the most case where teachers hadn't the, the specification completed. So um, I'll be honest with you, it was a very stressful journey this year and I for one uh, was so grateful to have the, 
the wide number of teachers out there that were were you know involved in 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 doing the report the the project and uh, you know people on the Facebook group people on Twitter and uh, you know in order to get great support in order to to bring it to its fruition so it was exhausting I mean it was it, there's no going away from it but you know when you actually step back from it you recognize this is a great thing. This is what economics is all about. This is um, going to be fantastic. It's going to be something that is going to, um, you know, broaden and deepen our subject and broaden and deepen the understanding of our students. Um, I think that to have a PME placed um, in a school where you're going to be um, helping the, the teacher with their um, research project is going to be fantastic for, for both, um, both involved. Um, your cooperating teacher is going to be so glad to see you. They'll, they'll hug you. Well, no, you, they won't because it's COVID. Um, <laughs> <Social distancing. laughs> they, they'll certainly feel like it. And you, you yourself are going to gain so much out of it. It's a steep learning curve for you as it was for even very experienced teachers were um, of the view. But I think now that we've actually gone through the paces, we've, we've kind of, we've climbed the mountain and we've looked around. We now are in a position where for next year, once the first um, uh, you know, group have actually gone through the research uh, study, we're going to actually see the results, see it, how it was marked, see what was a good idea to do, see what wasn't a good idea to do. Um, you are going to be coming straight from college. You're going to be amazing on the referencing side. You'll be such a support to your cooperation teacher um, you know, and such a support to the students involved. Um, and I think it would be um, a very good environment for you to learn. I mean, for those of us who are out teaching already, um, we basically, for most of us, we're, the economics teacher is the only economics teacher in school. And you're, you're, it's your baby, basically. And these students are yours, you know, to, to, to shield and to bring through and to, to, to nurture. And they're... Um, their project, um, their project completion is, you know, was number one in all of our minds. Um, so needless to say, no, not a, an economics teacher in the, the country slept until they were, you know, basically, you know, put away. Um, and what I would say, and I, I've said this to the PMEs in, in UL, um, is that, um, you know, embrace it. Um, see it for what it is. It's an opportunity, it's a huge opportunity for learning. There will be, um, uh, you know, a huge amount of um, yeah, um, detail that you'll, you'll be able to get the, from the uh, PDST sources and from, I suppose, the specification. And really, what I, I suppose what I would advise um, anybody starting out is stick like glue to the specification, stick like glue to, to the requirements. Um, there's a checklist there that was um, uh, you know, added, I think by Keen and PDST towards the end. And that's a fantastic uh, you know, way to make sure that you have done absolutely everything on the tin. It's going to be, um, it, it's going to be a lot of work, but it is going to um, make you very employable because um, once you go to your school and you've already gone through the throes of and supporting a teacher with um, their um, their submissions, it will be fantastic, uh, and it will stand to you. And um, uh, you know, I, uh, best to luck with it. Okay, thank you. So I breath for you that. Uh, thank you, Marie. That actually brings us to the end of the questions. But before we do, I think it's important to just. I there's a tweet that's come into the Dublin branch Twitter, and I know Brethy won't have seen this, um, and none of the panelists will. And I think they need to. I think they need to hear it. Um, it came from Dylan Sweeney. I don't know if Dylan is still on the is still on the webinar, but it says um, PME NQT Q&A is highlighting how brilliant the business teacher community is. I'm lucky to be starting my career supported by such passionate educators and yourself, Brethney, Michael and Joe, you're all tagged in this tweet. And I just think it's um, a testament to the business teachers that we have. And I think we need to welcome people like Dylan into the business. And I think... Um, our national president there, Margaret, put up that uh, she welcome to the family. And I do think that business teachers are definitely a family and especially the ones on Twitter. So I just thought that was a nice way to put that out there to all the panelists. I'll leave it over to you, Brett. Oh, before I do leave it over to Brethney, um, the certificate of attendance is there in the chat, everybody. If you could please make sure and download it. We're not going to be in a position to email them out to everybody. So if you could download it before you go off. And I also put into the chat all the links for the upcoming workshop. Okay, Brethany, over to you for the last word. Oh, uh, look, I've, I've nothing to say, Bar. Tonight's session is made up by the three people who, who kind of answered all the questions. Um, obviously, without them, 
we would have had it. So, so certainly my sincere thanks to Joe, to Michael and to Murray for giving your time because that's what you do. You, you, you aren't getting paid for this event. You do it because you love teaching. We're not getting paid. I mean, <laughs> 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 I, I'm, I'm coming out of that with Joe. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> But, but also, again, um, to, to everybody who attended this event, when I initially uh, ran this idea by our national conference and within our own branch, I had said we might be able to get 30 or so PMEs. Um, and I think during the course of this call, we, we certainly had over 100 people. So to anybody who took their time out on the day before their Easter break to actually uh, come and sit down and listen to, to, to us as well for two hours, we're very grateful for that as well. Um, look, join your BSTI, your local BSTI branch, you'll get lots of this information and, and look, I think I have it here, which is to say have a great Easter to everybody and, and look, we'll see you soon in, in some form or another. Oh, sorry, what my principal would always say to us is stay positive and negative and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. Rachel.